Prisoner of war camps are small contained worlds in which civilised human behaviour is often absent. Yet even though Australian prisoners had many reasons to dislike, perhaps even to hate, their captors, they found that a few treated them with compassion and humanity. Only once in one camp I was in, there was a Jap guard. He was a soldier, he was an engineer. His name was Horiyushi. And he told us that he was a Christian. And he acted as one, you know, he was as good as he could without losing face amongst his cobbers. He treated us with whatever he could. Uh, in, in the two camps that I spent with him, The Japanese camps on the Thai-Burma Railway were brutal places, and Dr Lloyd Cale and his men endured beatings and starvation. But on a rusty, decrepit cargo ship on their way back to Singapore, Lloyd encountered some unexpected behaviour from his enemy. There was a little Japanese lieutenant who could speak very good English there and talked to him a bit, and I don't know how long we might have been, 10 days or a fortnight or something getting down there. And he became very interesting and he told me he'd been a professional baseball player and he'd been in Manchuria fighting and so forth and so on and da 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 da. And he had no doubt that they were going to lose the war. And I used to talk to him there and at night and he got on and one night he said to me, when this war is over, what will happen to you? And I said, well I don't know, and if, I, if I survive I'll go back to my country. He said, back to your country? And I said, yes. He said, oh I cannot understand that. And I said, why? He said, oh, we cannot do that, no. So he stopped then for a while and he said, do you see that star up there? And I said, yes. And he said, do you see that star up there? And I said, yes. He said, that's your God, that's my God. And that's about as near as I've ever got to the Japanese. Extremely, very interesting little bloke, really. In a prison camp, small moments of humour or generosity, which would barely rate a mention at other times, can take on great importance. Sister Berenice Tuhill and 350 other missionary fathers, brothers and nuns were captured when the island of Rabaul fell in 1941. For a while she lived in a hut surrounded by Japanese soldiers. And in front of us they put their wounded soldiers, their hospital, and those poor creatures we used to feel so sorry for. Um, they were just there, you know, no sanitary conditions, nothing, nothing. How we lived through it, I don't know. How we didn't get all the disease and everything else, I don't know. In the piano, we had it on a, a little veranda out in front, it was just near the barbed wire, and these poor little creatures would come along and they'd listen, and when you finished, they'd clap and they'd more and more, you know. It, you know, you feel so, so sorry for them. In some of the German camps, the prisoners continued to wage war in the only way they could, by continually plotting escape. They looked on some of their guards with contempt. The difference between the prisoners and the guards was that the quality of the guards, <laughs> on a scale of A to Z, they were Z because anybody with any intelligence or ability was at the fighting front. And the guards who were too old or too stupid, and, but in the services, were sent to be guards to us. That suited us fine, because to be an air crew, your educational level had to be very, very high indeed. We had 24 hours a day, seven days a week, doing nothing but plot how we would get out of it and how we would outwit the Germans, psychologically, physically, in every possible way, bluff, whatever. In Southeast Asia, the Australians could not behave that way with their Japanese and Korean guards. For one thing, escape was virtually impossible. Still, the prisoners found other ways to strike back, often by giving the guards nicknames. Ethel Moffat was a prosecutor in the war crimes trials at the end of World War II, and he collected a list of these nicknames. Here are just a few. 
Ming the Merciless, Intercourse, Intercourse Henry, The Ghost, Flannelfoot, The Weirdo, Weasel, Junior Ball Kicker, Little Marmite, Scarface, Red Eyes, Gold Tooth, Joe Louie, Fish Face, Goldfish, Sila, The Big Cook, Frenchie, Wrestler, Tick, Quick Quack, Big Annie, Whispering Bear, Big Marmite, Mr Middleton Jr, Bullfrog, Maggots, Ball Kicker, Little Ball Kicker. <laughs> but the overwhelming memories the prisoners of the Japanese have of their guards are unpleasant and dark. It was so depressing, uh, this dark tunnel and no light at the end of it because we had no news. It was day after day, we lived on our nerves. We didn't know whether we'd be alive tomorrow or the next day or the next day because they'd shoot you for nothing or belt you for nothing. So we were living on our nerves day by day. I continually walking around the camp, harassing people, doing what they were, whatever they were doing, standing them up, making them bow to them, and uh, which, was a, which was a bloody awful experience, having to bow to a bloody Jap. And when I, even these days, when I see somebody bound to a Jap, oh, it just makes my blood boil. To former prisoners of war like Bill Coventry, it seems inexplicable that, as much as the Australians may not have understood the Japanese, the Japanese did not, in turn, make any attempt to understand them. It's, they're not logic. They want something done. They get an order from up above and they want men. All men do this, all men do something else, you know. And the way they'd line 200 men up or any number of men, they go along, they, they couldn't count. We would line up in fives, we'd line up in ten. And they couldn't count 30 men. They were just peasants. And so we'd have to count ourselves. Prisoners of war are sometimes able to form relationships with local people, even in a hostile country. Arthur Leggett was captured on Crete after the Battle of Retamo in May 1941. Eventually, he ended up in Munich, Germany, where he spent around 18 months. Working with Germans changed his views about his enemy. The people of Munich are, are remarkable people. They're, they're the finest people I've met in all my life, actually. And they, they really took to us. The day that we were taken to this place, the Germans just looked at us and we thought, yeah, they're bloody British, you're German, all right. But next day they came in and they brought in food off their ration cars. They never realised men could look so bloody awful. And we thought it was hostility, but it wasn't. It was just shock. And we grew quite well. And of course, as we got our Red Cross parcels on a regular basis, which was one parcel a fortnight, we would muck in with someone else so that two of you would have a parcel between you every week. And we used to whack out a few things to these Germans and we'd become quite matey, actually. But of course, Arthur was not really free, just pretending for as long as possible. He could not ever forget that, despite the commonalities he shared with his German workmates and new friends, they were still at war with each other, and only one of them was a prisoner. We were locked up. We're in a prison camp. You can't overcome that. It's not a, a nice thing at all. And so as we started to pick up in our health and our attitudes and our spirits, so we started to look around a bit. And you're in the German city, so you, you get the hang of the Germans and you don't exactly hate them like you did and because they're no different to us. And you begin to realise this and they respond to your friendship. You just think, well, what the hell is it all about? In fact, they there's several Germans there said to me, well, what the hell are we fighting each other for? You and I are getting along all right. We're not scrapping and working in harmony with each other. But uh, what can you say? You can't say, well, look, mate, is this bastard Hitler? Because <laughs> they weren't allowed to say that themselves. In Libya, nearly 150,000 Italians became prisoners of the gallant army of the Nile. This week, a large body of them disembarked at an Australian port, a long, long way from home. None of the prisoners claim to be fascists, but whatever they call themselves, we call them enemies, and shall be happy to accommodate them behind the barbed wire for the duration. 
Australians have also been captors. During the Second World War, we imprisoned not only Italian, Japanese and German servicemen, but also those Australian citizens considered to be enemy aliens by the Australian government. Men like Ralph Panucci were taken from their homes and interned. All the Italians were all enemies. No one that wanted anything to do with the Italians anymore here. And that's when this idea of jealousy started, putting the Italians in. Once this internment idea started, that, that was the finish of it. Because if I, if I lived here and you lived three houses up and we had a bit of arguments and done something in between of us, you'd be the first one to put me into so. Ralph Panucci, he belongs to that society, he belongs to that uh, party, he belongs to the other party. And once they get us letters, they didn't check out to see what I've long, what I've done, or nothing. Once I got that letter, they pick you up and take you in. Many of the Italian soldiers worked on farms in Australia and lived reasonably comfortable lives. And the farmers were delighted to have the extra labour. By 1944, 10,200 Italian prisoners of war were working on farms or in hostels, but the 1,585 German prisoners of war and 2,223 Japanese in Australia remained in camps. Over a thousand Japanese were in number 12 prisoner of war compound near Cowra in the central west of New South Wales. But unlike the 21,000 Australians in Japanese camps, these POWs were well fed and living in comfortable quarters. In August 1944, information was received by the camp authorities that the Japanese were planning a mass outbreak. And in the early hours of the morning of August the 5th, it happened. The Japanese had rushed from their huts and begun breaking through the wire. The Australian soldiers on guard fired into the groups of prisoners, but around 400 broke through and escaped into open country. They were armed with knives, baseball bats and clubs studded with nails. Trevor Parker was stationed in a nearby training camp. We got over there, we found it was all ablaze and um, there was a bit of gunfire still going on and we only had sidearms, you know, the bayonet and the scabbards. And we were to encircle the whole of the camp, which we did. And we could see then, even whilst it was dark, that there were bodies hanging from trees and we could also see them hanging around in the undergrowth nearby, these chaps as they were. It took nine days to recapture 334 of them. 234 Japanese were killed or suicided and 108 were wounded. Four Australians were killed and four were wounded. In Australia, this incident was seen as a breakout from prison. But to the Japanese, it represented an honourable death. Whatever the differences then, today the site of the prison is preserved as a memorial to all the men who died there.